I want to welcome everybody here this morning. We have a large number of visitors with us. We are thankful that you're here. We hope that our time together is uplifting and edifying and hopefully instructive for all of us as we seek to know what God's will is and to understand more about his word. The whole reason any of us are here today is because we believe in God and we believe in Christ. The importance of knowing what Christ has said and what he wants us to know to be pleasing to him is necessary for our salvation. We want to be saved. We want to go to heaven. A couple of weeks ago, we discussed the fact that there are so many quote-unquote religions and faiths in this world. And how can somebody who's diligently searching, trying to find the way to heaven, understand or figure out which quote-unquote church is right? And as we discussed, we talked about from Ephesians chapter 4, that there is one faith. There is one baptism, one Lord. And based on that, building from that, we also know that there is one authority. And that is Christ Jesus, whose word we have in our Bibles. This morning when we'll talk about a specific aspect of faiths that people have, uh, religions that people follow. There are three main uh, religions that promote this idea, but countless others who may not be affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or any other have this thought, have this idea in their mind that Peter, the apostle, was the first pope and that as a result, everything since then coming from the Catholic Church has been what Peter started. This morning I want to consider with you what the Bible says about Peter, why it is that people believe that Peter was the first pope, but also extrapolate from that more fundamental elements to help us understand the authority of God's word and not going beyond it. Because no matter what religion or church or faith it is, Ultimately, the standard by which we will be judged is the Word of God. And we need to make sure that everything we do, everything we say, everything we believe is based on what God has told us. So, as we begin, we're going to talk about three main principles or arguments that people have with regard to Peter being the first pope. The first thing is the most common, perhaps, that we encounter coming from Matthew chapter 16 that it was upon Peter that Jesus built his church and as a result Peter being that foundation then formulated his position as Pope in Rome which then according to the the history of the Catholic Church as they claim then established the Catholic Church from there on out the second aspect is that he was made a vicar May the vicar, this term vicar is a very uh, specific term that is used with regard to Peter being the first pope. And the thought process is that he became that in John chapter 21, that Jesus made him his vicar on earth. And then the third thing is that Peter was the chief bishop, first in Jerusalem and then ultimately in Rome, which... All of this is based from Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. The fact that he took the lead there in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 and established himself by direction of Jesus as chief bishop in Jerusalem, leading to his being the pope in Rome. We're going to look at this going backwards. We're going to look at these points starting with the chief bishop in Jerusalem and ultimately leading to being a pope in Rome. And the reason we want to cover these things is twofold. One, well, threefold. We want to make sure that we're prepared to be able to, to present this information to our friends and our neighbors. People that we come into contact with that may think Peter was the first pope. But the reason that they think that is because it's been 
mentioned and said over and over and over again so much that it's ingrained in some people's minds, whether they are Catholic or not. Another reason is so that we ourselves know what the gospel says about Peter and its, his relationship to being a pope, but also thirdly, to emphasize both to us and to our neighbors the need to go to God's word to make sure that everything we do is right. We know from 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 1 that Peter was an elder. The elders who are among you, Peter says, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. When Peter writes and he addresses specifically the elders among the saints, Peter says, I am a co-elder. I am a fellow elder. He doesn't say, I am the elder. And notice as he mentions this in chapter, uh, and uh, so 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 1, he says that this is a witness, he's a witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. And then in verse 4, notice he mentions the chief shepherd. He's referring to elders. Elders, there are three main ways in which elders are referred to, and they focus not so much on their titles. These aren't titles of these men. They are descriptions of the office that they hold. One is shepherd, two is elder, and the third one is bishop. All three, it doesn't make any difference. They're all the same thing. They are just pointing out different elements of that office, different responsibilities of that office. So when Peter says, I am a fellow elder, he is not greater than, he is the same as. Which also means he is the same as from the perspective of that office in the role of the bishop, a bishop, and the role of a shepherd. But notice who he says is the chief. Verse 4. Jesus is the chief shepherd. He is the one from which all of us follow. He's the one. He's the shepherd. We are overseers over flocks, but then we submit ourselves to him. In Acts chapter 20 and in verse 17, we know that Paul, when he got to Miletus, he sent for the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet him there. In Titus chapter 1 and in verse 5, Paul told Titus that the reason I left you in Crete is so that you could set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. Notice Acts 20 and verse 17, what it doesn't say. That he sent for the elders and the chief bishop. That's what it should say if, the Catholic, as the Catholic Church claims, this is what the church was in the first century. But over every church, they may have had elders, plural, but there was always a chief bishop, the one main leader. Paul didn't send for the chief bishop and the elders. He sent for the elders. Paul didn't tell Titus to establish a bishop in every city. Appoint elders in every city. And not even an elder in every city. Elders. Always plural. The term pope goes back to a, a phrase which represents bishop, but also the idea of priest. And as a result, you have this hierarchy of priesthood within the Catholic Church, and for that matter, in many other types of churches that go along with the same idea. That's what the term pope, and it's going back before 900 AD, that's what it represented was bishop. Well, we know a bishop is an elder. They're one and the same. But when it comes to priest, that's a little bit different. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 5, Peter says, you also. He's not talking to the, el the elders at this point. He's talking to all the saints in 1 Peter chapter 2. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Notice he, he says that all, all the saints 
are a holy priesthood. In verse 9, he says it again a little bit differently. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter, on two separate occasions here in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, refers to the saints as a priesthood. Not as elders being a priest, or bishops being a priest, or having specific priests over everybody. All of them are priests from the perspective that, as the priests under the old law, served in the temple, and they served in the worship and the serving of God, we as Christians are able to enter into the inner workings of the temple, so to speak. And we are able to serve in the temple. We are able to commune with the Lord. That's why we are a quote-unquote priesthood. In Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 5, as John is introducing the letter of the revelation from Jesus, and he he's going to describe Jesus here in a minute, he says in verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's not just talking about the apostles. He's not just talking about elders. He, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Was that only the elders? Was that only the apostles? No. It was all the saints. And for that matter, the letter of Revelation is written to the seven churches of Asia. Not just to elders and not just to apostles. To the saints. He has made us kings and priests forever and ever. In Matthew chapter 20, the mother of the brothers Zebedee came to Jesus and had a request. She wanted James and John to be at both hands uh, in, in heaven, in the kingdom. Both hands of God. And Jesus makes a statement about that and basically in verse 23, he says, that is not my authority to give. That's only the Father's. And in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 20, when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself. So notice what he's saying here is specific to the apostles. The principle applies to all of us. But he's dealing with this thought process as who can be in more authority over another apostle. Who can have a higher status or a higher position than the other apostles? Jesus, verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says, this is not going to be the way it is with you. There's not going to be some hierarchy among the apostles. There's not going to be some that are better than others. You want to be a great apostle? And for that matter, you want to be a great disciple? Serve each other. Humble yourself to be a servant to another. That's what Jesus emphasizes. But this stands in stark contrast to the way different religions paint Peter in the things that take place after Jesus is, is killed. Peter takes charge, and all of a sudden he's the leader. And everybody pays attention to Peter, and Peter only. Because he was the one that was given authority from Jesus. And so nobody else had to say so. That's how people think of it. Yet Jesus himself says, this is not the way it's going to be. That's not how I'm establishing things. The argument of Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. That note how that Peter is the vocal one. Taking charge in Acts 1 about uh, bringing in 
uh, of a new apostle to replace Judas. Uh, the mention in chapter 2, how that Peter, yes, Peter's mentioned, but all of the apostles are teaching and preaching. Peter may be one of the, the vocal ones, and he might have been taking the lead, but they're all up there together speaking in tongues and declaring the wondrous works of God. It's not until verse 41, though, that the church is established. So to use Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 to show how that Peter is the chief bishop of the church is erroneous simply from the fact, not only from the evidence and the context, but from the simple fact that the church wasn't even established yet in Acts chapter 1, and it wasn't established yet until verse 41 of chapter 2. In Acts chapter 15, even in Jerusalem, remember when they had the situation that arose regarding circumcision? And how that there were those who were teaching you cannot be baptized and be saved unless you are first circumcised. As if the doorway to Christianity and salvation was Judaism first. You have to become a Jew, then you can become a Christian. But in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas and these teachers, they go to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and the elders. By that point, Peter should have been the chief bishop, he should have been the authority in Jerusalem. If what we're told is true about Peter being the first pope. He may not have been pope yet. They say pope, he didn't become pope until he got to Rome. But he was the chief bishop in Jerusalem as of Acts 1 and 2. So by Acts chapter 15, why go to the apostles and the elders? Just go to Peter. Well, Peter, the chief bishop, can kind of sort all this out. Well, Peter's not even mentioned in that grouping. It says elders and apostles. And they did. In John chapter 21, John chapter 21 and verse 15, we have the basis of the text which we call the, uh, Peter's great confession. There's actually several occasions where this statement is made not only by Peter but also by other disciples. Uh, but but. We call this the great confession from Peter. In verse 15 of John chapter 21, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, that's why he was called Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, he said to him, feed my lambs. To put this in context, this is at the Sea of Tiberias after Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. And Jesus is there. He has fish and he's cooking fish and he's even eating breakfast with them to show that he is physically alive. He's been raised from the dead. He's not an apparition. And as he speaks to Peter specifically, he says, do you love me more than anyone else? And Peter says, yeah, absolutely I do. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he repeats himself. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. I apologize. I mentioned the, the great confession that's actually coming down here in a minute. That's not John 21. Jesus three times asks Peter, Do you love me? Well, yeah, I love you. Feed my sheep. The thought process here is that in doing this, he is, Jesus is appointing Peter specific authority. I want you and you only to take charge to be my representative here on earth. You are to feed my sheep and only you. Throughout the rest of the context, verse 18 and following, and even before in verse 14, 13, nothing's established about that idea. Rather, the reason why Jesus asks him three times, I believe, had more to do with the fact 
that G Peter denied him three times. Three times, Peter refused to acknowledge that he was with the Lord when Jesus was being tried. Keep in mind, this is before the events of Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Three times, Jesus says, do you love me? Yes, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. In essence, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, remember how Peter went out and wept bitterly after the cock crew and he realized that Jesus, when he said, you'll deny me three times, it came true. Jesus was right. Even though Peter said, no, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. This is really the first time we see Peter since that event. And Peter, whatever he was dealing with, coming to terms with the fact that he had denied Jesus and in essence proven that he was a liar. He was not willing to die for the Lord because three times he denied him. It's almost as if Jesus is refocusing Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Despite the fact that Peter had denied him, I do love you. Those, that weakness he had in that moment of that trial, Peter's having to come to terms with that. It's as if Jesus is helping him here. At no point do we see anything of Jesus saying, okay, now I want you to be the one in charge. And I'm going to tell the other apostles and the other disciples that everybody needs to listen to you because you are going to be my representative on the earth. The term vicar is a person who acts in place of another, a substitute. So you're going to act in my place. You're going to be as if I were still here on earth, but that authority that I have is now going to be on you. But in particular, I want to emphasize this second part of this definition. A person authorized to perform the functions of another. I want to emphasize that. Because that's what people think Peter is made here in John chapter 21. That this is somehow the authority from Jesus transferred on to Peter. What's interesting is when we go to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, and this is what we call the Great Commission, Jesus came and spoke to the disciples, not the disciples, the apostles, in verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age." Notice the very things that he told Peter to do. Feed my sheep. Strengthen, encourage. And if you are going to even extend that further to bring in new sheep, okay? Whatever it was he told Peter here, of feeding his sheep, is reiterated not only to Peter, but to the rest of the apostles. Not only are they to strengthen, and notice verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Go and make new sheep. Bring them into the flock. But then instruct them in how they are to always follow what I've said. Peter wasn't given anything specific or different than any of the other apostles. The thought, common thought is that the Pope is infallible. That after one is made a Pope, or for that matter, even a chief bishop, that they're not really capable of doing anything wrong or making bad decisions. To be fair, the Roman Catholic Church has clarified what they believe regarding the Pope, that he is is allowed to be fallible as a man unless he's sitting in the papal chair. And everything he says from the papal chair, that is canon. That is God's word. Ironically, everything generally that the Pope says from the papal chair, they're very careful to quote scripture so that they're not wrong. 
But what we see in Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 11, Paul says, I had to withstand Peter to his face because he was to be blamed. I don't want to deal with the fact uh, or, or uh, have to, to the, the idea that, well, obviously Peter's fallible. Okay, he's a man. Yeah. My focus that I want to focus on here in verse 11 and 12 is notice how Paul, who would have just been an apostle, lowly apostle, compared to even if Peter wasn't a pope yet. Keep in mind, this is years later after the establishment of the church. Even though Peter may not have been pope yet, he still at the very least was chief bishop in Jerusalem. Yet Paul withstood him to his face publicly. That's why in verse 14, I said to Peter before them all, you would think that if Peter were a chief bishop, the chief bishop, if he had some special authority, some special standing, that at the very least, Paul shouldn't have called out Peter for his sin of hypocrisy, whether it was because he didn't realize it or not. He shouldn't have done that in public, surely. There was no difference between Paul and Peter. They both were apostles. Now, what about the main one in Matthew chapter 16? This, out of everything, is perhaps the, the biggest argument that people make. Because in Matthew chapter 16, people read this, and maybe without looking too deeply into it, they say, well, this is obviously something specific with Peter. When I was growing up, there was a next-door neighbor. They were Catholic. And there was this picture hanging in their hall. And I, I think it was meant to be figured. I don't think it was meant to be literal. But still, Jesus had an actual, actual set of keys that he was handing to Peter. And it's always been there in my head when I think about this passage of Matthew chapter 16. Is that that's the mindset that people have when they think about Peter and Jesus passing along these something spe special to Peter. But in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? Verse 14, they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, who do you say that I am? This isn't to say that the other apostles didn't believe it too. Peter, you know how Peter was. He was kind of hot-headed, the first to jump in, last one to think sometimes. I can only imagine he was the first one to try to answer. Verse 15, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Keep in mind, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. That's what he's saying. You, Jesus, are the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, you, Peter, are Simon, the son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. How was that revealed? Not only through the words Jesus spoke, which Jesus says came straight from the Father, but also the miracles and the signs that he did, which were the approval of the Father and authorizing those miracles to be performed the father has shown you this verse 18 and i say to you you are peter who do men say that i am who do men say that you are peter you're peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades shall not prevail against it at no time does Jesus, or at least are we told, Jesus takes Peter off from the rest of the apostles. But instead, notice as he's talking, and, and for that matter, notice he's speaking not just to the apostles here, but earlier in verse 13, disciples. This isn't just the apostles necessarily. Disciples. So when Jesus says, I say to you, you are Peter. I'm going to answer the question just like you did. And on this rock, what rock? What rock will Jesus build his church? Well, is it Peter? 
Because that's the argument. That upon Peter, Jesus will build his church. And notice verse 19, I will give you. The idea is you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the thought process that Jesus is speaking directly to Peter here. Well, first of all, let's kind of take a look at this and consider the fact that this has to, this has to, to be in harmony with other scriptures too. You can't just take this one passage and say, this is it. All the scriptures are in harmony. Let's make sure we have an understanding of what's going on. When we consider what Peter was given, we think about Acts chapter 2. Peter and the other apostles teaching the word of God, ushering in uh, the establishing of the kingdom of God by baptizing these thousands of people on the day of Pentecost. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18 and in verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Je Notice disciples again. Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you in verse 18, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Peter's not even mentioned specifically here in Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. The very same thing that he told Peter, he says the same thing to the disciples. And notice what it's speaking to. Whatever you bind on earth, we be bound in heaven. This is actually in a broader context regarding the brother who sins against me or has ought against me. The brother that won't listen to the church. He is to be a heathen and a tax collector. This context isn't the idea that we make rules and we make laws and we can change God's word because God will then change it in heaven because we change the law. We changed what, yeah, well, this isn't really modern enough. We need to update the Bible. That's not the context of 18 through 20. It's in context of acknowledging people who aren't serving and doing what they should be doing. Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, this is in context of recognizing an individual who is not doing what they should be doing, will be bound in heaven. Because the saints who regard this brother or sister who is not living the way they should, they regard them as a heathen and a tax collector from the perspective that this person is not serving God. You acknowledge that on earth because it's, it's already acknowledged in heaven. It's not that what you do on earth, God's going to change his mind on things. That's not what it is. It's a broader context. So the fact that Jesus gives these same keys to everybody negates the idea that something specific is happening in Matthew chapter 16 that is special to Peter. But even beyond that, consider Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 19. When Paul says, therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, not on Peter, on the apostles and prophets, Peter himself being the chief cornerstone. Is that what verse 20 says? That's not what verse 20 says. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone was the very first brick or block of a foundation of a house that was placed. And it was used to be able to map out the rest of everything else. Jesus was the foundation upon which everything else was built. Everything else, even the foundation of the church, everything started with Christ. The reason why the apostles and the prophets are there was because they revealed the word of God furthering the foundation of the gospel to understand the fullness of it. And then the church was built based on that word of God that was revealed from the apostles and the prophets and Jesus himself. 
Notice he says in verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together. In who? Peter? No. In Jesus. Grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 22, Paul says, Jesus, or, or the, actually this is talking about the Father, he put all things under Jesus' feet and gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, Jesus' body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Wait, who's head over the church? The Pope? Some kind of line of succession starting with Peter? No, Christ is the head. Just as Nolan mentioned in his prayer at the very beginning of service, that it comes from Jesus Christ and we put our focus on Christ and what He's revealed to us. Colossians 1 and verse 18, Christ is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all He may have the preeminence. What did Jesus say at the Great Commission? I have been given all authority in heaven, but Peter, you've got all authority on earth. That's not what Jesus said. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Was Jesus, did the Father ever tell Jesus that he can then place all that authority on somebody else? Who can then change the law and make, make it, uh, adapt it to the, the times to be more modern? Don't read that anywhere. And it seems like Paul still seems to think that Jesus has the preeminence. He doesn't share it with anyone. In Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 10, Paul says, You are complete in Him, Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. Principality and power, yes, there is the idea of the authority the Father's given the Son in heaven, but principality and power generally refers to authority of the, of the physical kind also. And Jesus has been exalted above all principality and power. He's the head of all of it. Verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head. Not holding fast to Peter? from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. No, the head, Paul's already established, is Christ. Christ is the chief cornerstone. Christ is the rock. And it is upon the fact that Christ was the Son of God. Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah that was sent, the Messiah of promise. It was upon this rock that's a fact. Upon this fact, Peter, I will build my church. We talk about facts. Not interpretation of facts. Not uh, biasness of how I look at facts. Allowing for some facts, but not others. Facts, by definition, cannot be changed. It is a fact. There is a set number of people in this building right now. You can't interpret that a different way. You can't maneuver the bias towards that view or anything else. It's a fact. It's not going to change. So when Jesus referred to this rock, upon this rock I will build my church, something that is stable. It's not sand. Remember, Jesus in the past has already made the, the comparison to Matthew chapter 7 about those who listen to his words and do them. I'll liken to a wise man who built his house on a rock versus the foolish man who doesn't listen and do what I say. He's a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. Upon this rock, this fundamental truth that I am the Christ, the Son of God, that is the basis upon which the church will be built. And the gates of Hades can do nothing about it. Nothing that, that hell can do. And notice, this isn't, this isn't a reference to, to Satan. It's a reference to the idea of the dead. There is nothing that can be made to stop it. And it is representative of the fact 
that ultimately Christ would be raised. That's why he says the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The only thing that could was by keeping Jesus trapped in death. But that didn't happen. He was raised from the dead. The devil lost his grip. And Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, established his church. In Hebrews chapter 1, and in verse 1, in the passage that Ben read, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. A couple months ago, we talked about the nature of continuing revelation and how so many religions, maybe some more than we realized, are built and predicated on the idea that God's word can be changed. And we used Hebrews 1 and 2, Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, as a reference to an understanding that why would God go back to speaking through men when now he speaks directly through his son? That would be like downgrading. Well, the same applies to Peter as Pope, much less any other man, as they substitute, and remember that definition, a person authorized to perform the functions of another. Who authorized Peter to perform the functions of Jesus? Nobody. And Peter didn't. Who authorized the succession of popes, so-called, for them to work in the same capacity as Christ? Nobody. But to that end, it's interesting regarding that definition because what does Christ continue to do today? He's our high priest. He enters in and is able to commune with the Father for us. And He's able to help us. Well, why would we go back to a man when now we have the Son of God? His Word being given to us and Jesus himself, the Son, able to appeal to the Father on our behalf. Why go back to a man? In the bulletin this morning, we talked about this idea of Peter being the first Pope. And I quoted from the apostles to, uh, from apostles to bishops from Francis Sullivan, the development of episcopacy in the early church. Notice what this fellow says, and he's Roman Catholic. Most Christian scholars from both sides of this divide, about Peter being the first pope, agree that the threefold structure of ministry, with one bishop among a number of presbyters, that would be elders, and deacons in each church, does not appear in the New Testament. You never see a bishop, and then you have elders and deacons. No, it's elders and deacons. Hardly anyone doubts that the Church of Rome was led by a group of presbyters for at least part of the second century. So nobody's even arguing that, or at least from a, a scholarly perspective, nobody can prove that, that the church in Rome had any bishop as the head of it until at least the second century. No doubt proving that bishops were the successors of the apostles by divine institution would be easier. And that's what the point is. That the succession of eldership, they took the role of apostles with all that authority given to them too. This didn't happen. It would be easier if the New Testament clearly stated that before they died, the apostles had appointed a single bishop to lead each of the churches they founded. But they didn't. They didn't do that. That's why it's not recorded. A Lutheran theologians further note, we honor Peter. And in fact, some of our churches are named after him, but he was not the first pope, nor was he Roman Catholic. 
If you read his first letter, you will see that he did not teach a Roman hierarchy, but that all Christians are royal priests. The same keys given to Peter in Matthew 16 are given to the whole church of believers in Matthew 18. Was Peter the rock upon which the church would be built? No, he wasn't. It was upon the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Was Peter made the vicar of Jesus? This authority placed specifically on Peter to serve as Christ on earth? No. That didn't happen in John 21 or anywhere else. Was Peter the chief bishop in Jerusalem, or for that matter, Rome? No. So was he the first pope? These are facts. This isn't interpretation. People can believe Peter was the first pope if they want to, but they have to believe it without any evidence from God himself. We have an understanding about how, our, how the church that belongs to Christ and how our congregation is to be set up and how it's to be... Uh, governed, how it's to worship, how it's to function. But on a broader note, do you see how the importance of adhering to the authority of God leads us down the path that God wants us? And the moment that we leave that path of authority, Authority of God's word, this is what I've commanded you, this is what I've proven example given to you, this is what I've told you to do and shown you to do. When you leave that and you infer, God will be okay with this. Or, you know, it doesn't say that, that Peter was actually made the you know, vicar of Christ, but, but we can assume it. What are you basing those thoughts on? Is it wishful thinking? Is it a desire to be able to have some concrete, uh, specific ties and, and, and rituals, rites? I've said before that the Catholic Church, I'm convinced, is a kind of a, a evolution of what took place in the letter to the Galatians. That the Gentiles being taught by Judaizing teachers in Galatians to merge the Jewish law with its rituals and its rites and the physical nature of the law with Christ. You have a priesthood. You have all of the little bits that people feel, feel are religious. People feel that it's holy. But feelings... Don't matter. What matters is whether or not we serve God in truth. Because he is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Not however way they want. That's the lesson for you this morning. Hope it's been beneficial for us to study this and to be able to be prepared to talk to others about the nature not only of Christ and Peter, the apostles, apostolic succession, but for that matter, the nature of the church and making sure we're listening to Christ and only Christ. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians to be baptized, to have your sins washed away. We offer an invitation to those who are Christians to make sure that you're walking down the path and if you've stumbled or you need help or you need prayers for encouragement, let us do that for you today. Is there anything we can do to help you Get to heaven. If there is, please come forward as we stand and sing.